Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast to get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Casey Grover. He is an emergency physician and an addiction medicine specialist. His Kevin MD article that he co-wrote is titled, Not Treating Addiction in Criminal Justice Settings Violates the Four Ethical Principles in Medicine. Casey, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very grateful to be here, and I'm grateful that you published my article on your site. So we'll get into your article in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Thank you. Yes. So I am trained in emergency medicine primarily. I did my residency at the Stanford Kaiser program in Palo Alto in the San Francisco Bay Area. Graduated in 2013. I've been kind of toiling away in the emergency department where I work here in Monterey, California for about 10 years. And then um, shortly after I graduated residency, we had a very young child, 19 months old, die of an opioid overdose. Mm. And my co-author and colleague, Dr. Reb Close, and I started our county's opioid safety coalition. So initially, it was trying to reduce opioid use and overdose. And as America has changed, we now are much more addiction treatment advocates. And we both sat for our addiction medicine boards and passed. And now both of us practice addiction medicine in addition to emergency medicine. And most recently... I put together a podcast for acute care providers on addiction, just because I felt like I got so little training in addiction during my training. And we see so much addiction throughout medicine, particularly in the emergency department. Paint us a picture. Tell us some stories about what exactly you're seeing in the emergency department as it comes to opioid cases. Oh, it's absolutely tragic. This is really funny to say, but as an addiction medicine doctor, I miss heroin. It was so much easier to treat. I have a large number of patients on buprenorphine. People might know the name Suboxone or Subutex. And when we started, people were predominantly on prescription opioids or heroin. They're both short-acting opioids and transitioning from short-acting full agonist opioids to buprenorphine was relatively easy. Unfortunately, as fentanyl has completely saturated the market, most of my patients, whether they want to or not, are using fentanyl. And fentanyl, unfortunately, when it's used heavily, is lipophilic. And it ends up that it stays in the body for days, kind of the way cannabis and THC do. You know, so we have some patients who test positive for fentanyl over a week after their last use. And it makes starting buprenorphine very challenging. And so it's been much harder to get people on buprenorphine, which is an exceptionally life saving treatment for opiate use disorder. And we're also seeing addiction changed. I mean, I had a patient last night in the emergency department who was using methamphetamine and couldn't figure out why she wasn't feeling right. And a urine drug screen showed that her methamphetamine had been laced with fentanyl. Mm. And so we're really seeing kind of addiction change. We just detected bromazolam. That's a designer benzo in our drug supply. We're starting to see isotinidazine. That's another novel opioid in our drug supply. We're starting to see hints of xylazine in our drug supply. It's it's, it's almost like it's every month we're kind of having to change what we're doing because the drug supply is changing and we're having to adapt to what our patients are seeing and feeling. So as an emergency physician, where does the role of addiction treatment come in in terms of buprenorphine and, and introducing that? Because I, I could imagine how busy you guys are in the emergency department. How does that enter into that conversation and treatment plan? Well, I mean, for years, I, forgive me, told patients with addiction, I'm sorry, we don't treat you. And that was okay at the time. And I, I remember as a resident, we had a gentleman who came in who clearly had a problem with prescription opioids. And we, frank, quite frankly, told him to get lost and not come back. And, and, and that was considered okay at the time. And I'll never forget my first year at my hospital, a, a dad brought his son into the ER for a problem with cocaine. And I grabbed one of the mental health nurses and we went in together and said, sorry, we don't do addiction. And, you know, it's really interesting. You know, you look at America, one in seven Americans will develop a, a substance use disorder or addiction at some point in their lives. And yet less than one in 10 gets access to treatment. So we stigmatize patients, we judge them, we don't offer them help and wonder why they don't get better. And so I think emergency physicians and first responders have kind of a, a chip on their shoulder of just why don't these patients get better? Why, why do they keep coming back? Why is there such recidivism? And what's incredible is if you actually offer them treatment, they get better. I have a colleague who's been in addiction medicine for 30 years here in, in the Monterey area and asked him, what percent of your patients are in long-term recovery? And I estimated he would say 5%, 10%. He said, I don't know, two thirds. And I about fell out of my chair in that he has a very different population. And, and I now have an addiction clinic myself. 
And probably about 50% of my patients are doing really well. And so I think for me, it started with, I, I just, I, I've got to do something for this person. They keep coming back. I don't get it. I spent a lot of time with patients with addiction. In fact, on kevinmd.com, I actually published two articles with one of my patients who had addiction. He was my co-author. They were his stories. Unfortunately, he has since passed from an overdose. But just, we needed to do something. And it's really incredible now when I walk in the room and I'm like, hey, Dr. Grover here, emergency medicine, addiction medicine. Patients really feel that they have something that can give them hope. I mean, I was working the other night and there was a 17 year old using fentanyl and I walked in the room and introduced myself and the mom burst into tears. She's like, I didn't know there were addiction doctors that could treat my teenager. It's really very empowering to, to give people respect, offer them treatment and give them and their families hope. So long-winded answer, but I think kind of the take home would be, we didn't do much for a very long time with addiction. We didn't see any improvement in those patients. And as we're doing better to offer addiction, we are now seeing positive outcomes. And I'm very pleased to say in my region, in our kind of central coast of California area, we have seven emergency departments and all seven have a drug and alcohol counselor in them. And you talk more about this in your Kevin M. Diarco that you co-wrote with Dr. Close, not treating addiction in criminal justice settings violates the four ethical principles in medicine. Now, tell us, how did your article come together? Pure anger, I'll be honest. So we had a case and I, I wrote about it in the article. It's the second case where a person with opioid use disorder had a fatal overdose after being forced to withdraw in jail. Mm. And, you know, it's really funny. I mean, the, I think I was very naive as an emergency medicine resident. We had a patient come in who seemed intoxicated. My response was, well, he can't be, you know, he can't be drunk. He's in jail. And my attending laughed and reminded me that you can get essentially any drug you want in jail, including alcohol. And, you know, it, it's a really tragic thing. I mean, I just published on my podcast this morning, an article looking at the diversion or kind of spread to the street market of buprenorphine. And what they found is that when people divert buprenorphine, it's largely to people who want to be treated for opioid use disorder and either don't have access to treatment or don't want to seek treatment in a traditional setting because of stigma and judgment. So the authors of this paper actually hypothesized that if you actually make buprenorphine more available, the diversion will go down. And I, I suspect that's probably true in a criminal justice setting. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I was always kind of taught that, you know, when you identify a patient who has a problem with opioids, you cut them off. Mm. Unfortunately, that just really precipitates withdrawal. So in this case, this poor person was clearly dependent on opioids, went into the criminal justice setting, basically white knuckled it, vomiting, diarrhea, body aches, chills, feeling horrible, intense drug cravings, and then promptly after leaving jail has their tolerance decreased for whatever time period of not using, and then goes and tries to seek relief and 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 get back to their drug use. And yeah, this is a mom who's left kids motherless because she died of an overdose. And I contrast this with patients that I see that come out of the criminal justice setting in, in a different area where they have access to buprenorphine and they're so busy working, I have to do phone appointments with them. They're like, hey doc, I can't make my clinic appointment. I, I've got to work because they're doing well. And that's the first case I highlight with Dr. Close in this in this paper is, yeah, this guy was doing really well. It, it just, it breaks my heart that, you know, we have such a life-saving treatment. I mean, I, I love this statistic. The number needed to treat to save a life for a patient with opiate use disorder by treating them with buprenorphine is 1.4. I can't think of a number needed to treat that good of almost anything. The number needed to treat to save a life for a protonic strip for an upper GI bleed is infinity, mm -hmm. meaning there isn't a mortality benefit. And yet buprenorphine has a number needed to treat for mortality of 1.4. Like, why are we not using this more widely? And I actually put this in my article. When France really deregulated buprenorphine in the 1980s, their opioid overdose mortality dropped by 80%. So I mean, I think the solution to opioid use disorder kind of on a kind of, and not like a comprehensive solution, but a really simple, easy to implement way to really reduce mortality from opioids in the US is really to get physicians comfortable with and prescribing buprenorphine. And not every patient wants buprenorphine. Some prefer methadone, some want withdrawal management. But I mean, in, in my hospital, we have so many physicians that just didn't train with it, aren't comfortable with it. And actually we're doing some grand rounds later this month to really try to increase the comfort physicians have with buprenorphine. 
So give us a sense in the incarceration setting, like how common is it that buprenorphine is available in a, in a jail setting? Yeah, and I have to be clear, in Monterey County, we have the, the jail staff, we work with them regularly. Dr. Close actually now goes to the jail on a regular basis and is trying to affect positive change. And in some ways, it's it's like anything, you know, change takes time and people's minds may not be as open to change as we would like. But yeah, here in Monterey County, we're trying to start a jail buprenorphine program that is robust and anyone who needs it can get access to it. We've started small. Dr. Close is working really hard. And essentially what it looks like is when people get brought into a jail or prison, if they have an opioid use disorder, they are offered treatment with buprenorphine. And again, unfortunately, I talked to loads of nurses who work in the criminal justice setting that talk about how buprenorphine is relentlessly diverted through the prison and jail systems. And again, coming back to this article that I just posted on my podcast, that is a review of buprenorphine diversion. It's largely because people want it to treat themselves, to not withdraw. And when it's inequitably distributed, then people will then take advantage of those uh, inequities to make a quick buck or in jail or prison, it's trading for goods or whatever it is. But I guess my thought would be is in an ideal world is if you have an addiction, as you enter the criminal justice setting, as you're a captive audience, we should treat it. And, and that might be with alcohol. I mean, uh, if if we gave every person who came through emergency departments in America who had a problem with alcohol, oral naltrexone mm -hmm. or oral acamprosate or gabapentin for alcohol use disorder, we could reduce drinking in literally millions of Americans. And, and we don't. So, I mean, in my practice, you come into the ER and you see me for an alcohol use disorder. You're going home with a medication for alcohol use disorder to reduce your intake. And I've tried to educate my colleagues and I have actually a, a lecture on my podcast, a plea to treat alcohol use disorder the way we do opiate use disorder. I think people have really gotten behind buprenorphine for opiate disorder. There's a great organization here in California called the California Bridge Program, which is basically designed to make addiction care on demand in the emergency department. And they have, you know, kind of very simple and easy to read treatment guidelines for emergency physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses. And it's great, but we can do so much more. And I think it's really because we don't do that much education on addiction. Dr. Close and I both attended medical school at UCLA. We both did residencies in emergency medicine. She did it at UCLA. I did it at Stanford. Between the two of us in those 15 years of education, we got one hour of training on addiction. And ironically, it was me on gambling addiction. So I don't know how you were. I mean, you learn the nuances of alcohol-related liver disease, the variceal bleeding, alcohol-related gastritis, but you never learn to go one step back and say, how do we reduce the alcohol use? Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what I'm, now that I have two specialties, I'm trying to synthesize together. So would you say that's the biggest obstacle? Is it the, the lack of education? Is it, is it a, a money issue also? Is there the misperception that the, the buprenorphine is being diverted? What would you say is the biggest obstacle? I think it's actually all of them, but I think the the biggest one is physicians are busy and it takes time to sit down and connect with a patient when you're busy. And I'll give you an example. So go in, I see a patient, they've got asthma. In fact, I did this last night. A uh, patient has asthma. They're actively smoking cigarettes. It's really easy to give them a dose of prednisone, check a chest x-ray, check a COVID swab, give them a little albuterol, feeling great, off you go. It takes more time to sit down and do a smoking cessation discussion. And last night, I will be totally honest, I was slammed and I, I didn't have time to do it. So I am, as much as I try to be kind of a warrior on this, I didn't have time last night. But to sit down and talk to people about Shantix and how does actually Nicorette gum work and how to mm -hmm. chew it properly, it takes time. And what I'm hoping to do is with my group here and kind of my colleagues on the central coast of California is make doing the right thing easy. I think what we find as physicians is if it's hard work, we'll kind of just skip that, that step and focus on the next patient to make sure we see as many people as we can, help as many people. But if it's easy, we can do it. And I think for me, it's just, hey, you know, would you be interested in naltrexone? Sure. Let me tell you what it does. It probably takes me 30 seconds to a minute. And I, I if uh, the number needed to treat for naltrexone to reduce drinking, depends on the study, but it's probably about one in 10. I mean, I probably see 10 patients with alcohol use disorder in mm -hmm. just three or four shifts in the ER. So I think, again, it's how do we make it easy, but also effective. I think the other thing is their shame and stigma. I mean, how many patients lie to their doctor about their alcohol intake? Probably most of them. One of my patients who I've really tried to be open with just got admitted for a relapse that she hid from me. And 
I haven't had a chance to see her in person because we've been doing telemedicine visits because she's a busy person and a mom. And, you know, it's, it's, she didn't want to admit that there was a problem. And I've really tried to create an open environment with her where she can feel safe. And even then people don't want to admit they have a problem because there's so much societal stigma around it. How much education would a typical physician need to be comfortable prescribing buprenorphine? So the traditional training was eight hours back when we had the so-called X waiver. The answer is, is it's probably about an hour. We're going to do a grand rounds for my physicians at my hospital next week. And one of our local gurus in addiction medicine, he's been doing addiction medicine longer than I've been alive, I think, um, is planning to talk kind of doc to doc, but this is how you do it. My experience with buprenorphine is that once a person's on it, it's pretty easy to maintain. It's kind of like lisinopril. You just kind of refill it every month as long as they're doing well. It's the initiation that can be difficult. And for that reason, a lot of times folks get sent into the emergency department because the way buprenorphine works, if it's taken at the wrong time, it can actually increase withdrawal symptoms and what's called precipitated withdrawal. So that's really the big learning curve, but that's something that my specialty has actually gotten relatively good at simply because we've kind of been the epicenter of opioid overdoses in the last 20 years. Now, if we were to make change across a country in the jail setting, though, does this need to come from grassroots physicians like yourself? Should there be policy changes? Like, how can we make changes in the incarceration setting across the country? I think it really comes down to anything that makes a positive change. I mean, I, I, I people always ask me, you know, gosh, you work in the ER. What's the worst thing you do? Is it gunshots? Is it bleeding? And I say, telling a parent their kid has died. There are no words to watch a mother sob while telling her or watching a father sob and telling him, your kid is dead. I mean, I get goosebumps right now as we're talking about it. And so whatever I can do to say that a young person doesn't have to die, I'm in. Now, that being said, you know, we've worked with our local sheriff, who's wonderful and super supportive. And, you know, she's top of the organization, kind of working top down to make it happen. And even then it takes time. So we've been working with our local lawmakers. We've been working grassroots. I mean, my colleague, Dr. Close kind of just said, hey, jail, here I come and was able to kind of go in on Fridays and see patients. So I think it's kind of, for me, you know, watching Americans die of addiction is an all hands on deck moment. I mean, 450,000 Americans die from tobacco every year, about 100,000 Americans die from alcohol every year, and about 110,000 Americans die from other drugs every year. We've got to do something. So you alluded to this earlier. Tell us a success story that you and Dr. Close saw in the ER based on I, successful implementation of, of addiction treatment in, in jail. Let me read you a text message I got just the other day. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. Hello. I hope you are happy, healthy, and thriving. I wanted to touch base with you and let you know that my friend's son that you helped with the Suboxone will have a year of sobriety in June of 2022. Thank you so much for helping him get his life back. This is a, a, a young individual who had not necessarily been justice involved yet, but unfortunately with substance use, that's the direction people tend to go. And then he came in to the ER, got him on Suboxone, and here he is a, a year later doing well. We're talking to Casey Grover. He's an emergency physician. He co-wrote the Kevin MD article, not treating it in criminal justice settings violates the four ethical principles in medicine. Casey, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Absolutely. I think the first thing is, is stigma and shame keeps people away from us as physicians and medical providers. One of the best things you can do is to avoid judgmental language. Don't call it a, a dirty urine. Call it an abnormal urine drug screen. Don't call them addicts. Don't call them alcoholics. They're people first. It's a patient with alcohol use disorder. It's a patient with opioid use disorder. And then educate yourself. You can make the most incredible changes in people's lives. And the federal government has also made changes here. In order to re renew your DEA, you'll have to do eight hours of training on addiction. So I think kind of to circle back to your original point about how can we affect positive change, the federal government has deregulated buprenorphine. Any physician can now prescribe it, including for opiate use disorder. And we're all going to be getting some more education about addiction. Casey, thank you so much for sharing those stories and sharing your time and insight. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.